So what tools do we have at our disposal to figure out what is the vector of failure? Um, so if we have a joint, um, say we have a significant joint in the neck, which is failing left anterior, um, that's going to have some, some effects in other aspects of our function. Obviously, we're going to have all the compensatory function, compensatory uh, uh, contraction of other muscles. We're going to have mechanical changes. We're going to have neurological consequences. How do we sift our way through all of these things uh, such that we can get a clearer idea of where the problem is? Um, the, 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 the key place, I think, to start is to understand that when we have a joint that is not in its normal resting state, so if we're trying to maintain a neutral posture, we have a subluxation, which is left anterior, uh, we're unable to get that joint to left anterior. So there's some resistance in that joint of coming back to, to neutral. So we've already discussed that in, in when we talked about the effects of trauma on joints. But if we have a joint which is essentially less capable of coming back, in other words, there's muscle tensions that are holding in that position, it's now less capable of coming back to neutral, it can't ever give that signal of what neutral is. So even in a resting state where perhaps all the other joints are giving good inputs, this one joint that is stuck is now giving a signal which is saying that gravity is coming from a different direction than it is. Imagine if all your joints are going left anterior, your brain is going to be in agreement and say, oh, uh, gravity is coming from this direction, okay? Whereas if all, all of our joints are functioning well and we're straight up, gravity will be coming from this direction. And all of the inputs from all of these joints will be telling our brain where gravity is coming from. Uh, however, in again, in this scenario where one joint stuck to the side, we have aberrant information. We call this noise. Um, so this noise coming into the system is basically an incorrect signal. I mean, obviously it's correct for that joint, but it's not in congruence with the other inputs. So our brain sees that as noise. Uh, in other words, it's getting all this signal. It's like, it's like um, uh, everyone's in agreement, except this one person is really kind of shouting out the wrong answer, okay? So um, when we have that sort of scenario, we have, to, we have to be able to filter out that noise. Um, and it's also quite probable that you might have more than one joint, uh, which is not moving ideally. So the more we accumulate these types of subluxations and proprioceptive errors, or this noise in our system, uh, where the joints aren't moving as we're telling it to, or the, and the so that would be a proprioceptive error, or the joint is stuck in a different position, that's going to be creating this constant tonic firing into the brain, saying gravity's coming from somewhere else. Now that information is very, very important to us, and we are getting affrontation on one side, but less affrontation on the other. So um, that the information is important to us. So our brain will start to tune out, <clears throat> or try to tune out that aberrant information. And the more of these subluxations we have, the more of our brain power is essentially given to trying to figure out exactly where we are in relation to gravity. So that can have, exhausting effects on our brain because we're constantly having to work on that. Have you ever adjusted someone and just feel, oh, my brain just feels relaxed? It's because you've taken away enough of those proprioceptive errors uh, such that their brain isn't having to deal with all of these errors anymore. It doesn't have to work uh, to try to drown them out. So, um, when we have a proprioceptive error, say, we, again, we just have this one joint that's stuck to the side, if that joint can't move effectively, then every time you're moving kind of in and out of that position, that motion, we're going to see a greater kind of failure. So where do we see this? Uh, we see it with head motion. So you can see that with head motion sometimes. Uh, certainly, if you try to challenge a joint where you try to bring it back to a neutral position, if you're palpating it, you'll feel a resistance there. And that's something that we do with the Adjusting to Neutral seminars is we teach you how to put the head in different uh, vectors and to see where you feel a resistance of that joint uh, coming back to a neutral. Okay, so it could be in many different vectors, but just say, for instance, it's left anterior. You put the head left anterior and you try to palpate from the right side and try to bring that joint back to a neutral position, you'll feel resistance, okay? And those are the resistances that we address and adjust uh, to enable the joint to come back to neutral. But from a neurological perspective, uh, if that joint is less capable of coming back to neutral, 
every function in that direction is going to be difficult. So if you're moving your head in that direction, that will be difficult. You have to think also as well about where the eyes are when your head is left anterior. If your head's left anterior, your eyes are going to be up here, okay? And so you might find that there'll be a difficulty of your eyes coming across that way. When you're checking your eye function, you might find that you can't get your eyes to come back to a neutral position when you're watching like this, okay? So when we see breakdown of eye function, uh, or we see a breakdown of head uh, motion, uh, both of those things can be really, really good indicators. But the P1 test is basically a way we can incorporate a lot of these eye tests with head tests. So we already incorporate head and eye motions together when we test things like the VOR, because we really have two different types of eye head functions. One where our eyes and head go in the opposite directions, okay? And one where our eyes and head go in the same direction. So if you hear a noise and you, you turn to look at the noise, your head goes about halfway and your eyes go the other halfway, okay? So head and eyes in the same direction, when you're doing big kind of letting go of something visually or you let go of something and you go to look at something else that's head and eyes in the same direction we call that a saccade eye head saccades okay when your head and eyes stay locked into something uh, and they go in opposite directions we call that a pursuit or gaze fixation okay so pursuit is when you're watching something move um, but a, uh, a VOR is when our head and eyes go in the opposite directions, okay? So that's another component of gaze fixation. So we can look at all of that and we can decipher where the breakdown is. Maybe it's an eye problem, maybe it's a neck problem. But what we're gonna be looking for primarily is neck problems that create eye problems, that create muscle problems in the neck. Okay, so we're gonna be working through it that way. The best way that I've found to be able to do this is through this test I call a P1 test. And what that means is the proprioceptive primary. So P1, one is primary, it's not rather than PP. Um, P1 is our proprioceptive primary. So in other words, which proprioceptive uh, error is the primary one? Which one is causing the biggest problems? And uh, there's a very, very simple way we can do that. Um, <clears throat> so I just mentioned that we have a VOR and we have eye head saccades where eyes and head are going in the same direction and we can test these things independently but in between VOR and and eye head saccade types of motions where eyes and head are going in the same direction we have what we call VOR cancellation what that means is that you move the head and the eyes at the same time so what you're doing is you're canceling out the VOR so your eyes don't move opposite to your head your eyes stay in the same place in relation to your head but your head is moving, okay? So VOR cancellation is really interesting because it rides that line between those two functions, okay? Um, and what we're gonna do with this test is take the person's head and we're going to move them into left and right rotation, up and down, and we're gonna have them look at our eyes. And at the same time that they're looking at our eyes, we're going to be moving our body so that we stay right in line with their head. So our noses are staying aligned to each other, if you will, okay? And then also what you can do is you go at angles like this. You're gonna go uh, back and to the right, down to the left, okay? Back to the left, down to the right. So you as a doctor are moving with that patient and you're staying right in front of their eyes, okay? As you do that, that's VOR cancellation. And we should see um, that the head will be able to move this way. But as you're doing this, what you need to be able to do is to palpate where you start to feel some resistances. So what, when we feel, we're feeling resistances, generally what we're feeling is resistance of those extrinsic muscles. So that might be just kind of that compensation. So that's a good thing to note. Um, but what we're going to do uh, within each of those motions is you're going to do a motion, okay? Do a motion once or twice. And then after you've done it once or twice, you're going to come into one of the end range of that motion. So it might be you take the head left anterior, and as you take the head left anterior and you move it back towards a neutral position, you stay in that position. So you stay in this position. So you're not doing a VOR times zero anymore. Okay, you're not doing VOR cancellation. You're doing VOR cancellation one or two times in a vector, and then you come down, and then you stay there. And when you bring their head back, you're going to elicit a VOR response, okay? So in other words, that means that their brain has to calculate where their head is and move their eyes in the opposite direction. So if their head's down like this and they're looking straight at you, 
okay? Then when you move back, they have to move their eyes further down to the left, but let their head come back to the right. When you do this, if you get a cervical colic reflex, what that means is you bring their head down like that, and as you try to bring their head back, it might feel like the neck just locks up, like it won't actually let you move it. That's a positive P1 test, and that is telling you that it's that vector where there's a joint that is not uh, calibrated to the other joints, okay? And so what you're going to do is if they fail left anterior, you're gonna put their head left anterior, you're gonna feel for resistance in their neck of whatever joint is resisting coming back to neutral. Whichever joint come, is resisting coming back to neutral, that's the one you adjust, you recheck it, and you won't have that cervical colic uh, response anymore. So this is how we do uh, a P1 test and let me explain how and why that works. When we have a joint which is say left anterior um, and and all your other joints are straight, there is a uh, the, the difference of gravity vectors. In other words, each, each uh, joint is going to be giving a signal of where gravity is and that one other joint is saying gravity somewhere else. So each joint is saying gravity's here, gravity's there, 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 and then we get to this one joint, it's gonna say gravi gravity's coming from over here because we're tipped like this. So it, your brain's gonna go, whoa, whoa wait, wait a minute. Um, however, if you take all of the joints in that left anterior, thing, uh, this scenario, and you take all of the joints left anterior, now that one's still saying left anterior, but the other joints are also now saying left anterior. What is the relative difference? We've actually decreased the error signal uh, when you're left anterior. So if you go into the direction where that primary proprioceptive error is coming from, what you're gonna have is you'll have good function. You should have good eye function there. You should have other good function, okay? But as soon as you take them away from that position in a way that has to rely on coordination of inputs from your joint mechanoreceptors, um, and coordinate that with your eye motion, your body's gonna go, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, because what you're doing is as you start to move the head, you're going to go from a, 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 a neurologic state of less uh, proprioceptive errors and straight headlong into the greatest proprioceptive error, because what's gonna happen is each of the signals are all saying this, 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 or, or the, sorry, they're all saying left anterior, and then as you start to come back, you have one joint that's saying, nope, it's not, it's still here. And your brain's gonna panic and tighten up the muscles, okay? So uh, it's not just a panic, but basically what you're doing is you're introducing a relative increase. You start to increase the proprioceptive errors, you ramp it up. So the more you try to move their head, the more you're going to increase proprioceptive errors. And when your body experiences proprioceptive errors, what does it do? Uh, just as we said about the vector of failure, we're going to have some compensation and our body's going to try to resist increasing a, a, a state of increase in proprioceptive errors. And so it, what it will do is it'll use your extrinsic muscles to uh, contract, to resist that, that, uh, that motion such that, um, such that you don't introduce more proprioceptive errors. So we can use this little trick of uh, combining VOR, eye head saccades, uh, and VOR times zero into a test where we're using a cervical colic reflex as our positive indicator that we've been introducing more proprioceptive errors into the system. So every time you're doing it, wherever you find a positive uh, P1 test, uh, that's going to tell you, well, there's probably a joint that's stuck there that as you're moving it back towards a neutral position, you should see that that joint can move and you're getting a, a consistent uh, input tonically of where gravity is. Even phasically, there's some, comp some, com some components of function there as well. But what you're going to be doing is, is basically changing the firing into those maps where you're basically highlighting the fact that there is a proprioceptive error there and your body will tense up. So this is a really, really cool tool uh, that I've created, um, and I would encourage everyone to try this out. It works very, very predictably and very accurately. And when you just adjust that joint in that direction, back towards neutral, whichever one you find stuck in left anterior, 
um, you adjust that joint only and you check everything and it's all going to clear beyond that what you'll find is you'll be you'll be able to not only resolve that particular proprioceptive error but if it's of significance that it shows up in a p1 test you're probably going to be resolving other issues as well and uh, the 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 uh, most uh, effective way to test that is to see what changes you've created in the autonomic function. So uh, I do this very, very regularly um, in resolving um, in, in trying to resolve those proprioceptive errors, creating greater congruence of affrontation into our into our central system. But also we know that uh, because there's so much affrontation coming from the neck as well, we have a great probability of getting that system to switch back on again and seeing better function all the way up to prefrontal cortex. Uh, and then thus controls of autonomic function. So I'll typically say, for instance, see a case where we have abnormal pupillary responses. You might see some hippus or some pupillary dilation to light. We can adjust this joint and see that the pupils will immediately start working. We'll see the bilateral blood pressures balance out. We'll see gut sounds return. We'll see better vascularization of the hands. All these things happen very, very quickly and as well, the extrinsic muscles that have been compensating around that vector of failure of that joint will also decrease in their tone and we'll see a return to a normal, a more normal range of motion. But as well, because we haven't driven that joint past its normal range of motion, we've just driven it back to neutral. And we've only resolved the, we've only applied our stretch to the intrinsic muscles, not the extrinsic muscles. Because when you take it from where it's stuck back to neutral, you're not really loading extrinsics. You're not creating a resetting of the gain of those. You're only and very specifically addressing the the resetting of the gain on those intrinsic muscles and in doing so uh, we can create a greater balance of those intrinsics greater stability of that joint because now it's not unstable in some vector it's balanced and we'll also see greater biomechanical control of the joint so we kind of resolve everything in one big bang um, and um, this to me feels like kind of the laser surgery kind of version of chiropractic I think it's uh, some really, really cool stuff that we can do. And and we have some, and the P1 test is a really, really powerful um, tool that I've found and, and am using. I'm sure there's many, many more, um, but it's one that uh, I would suggest we all uh, try working with and see um, what it's showing you and to gauge uh, your responses and your, your um, improvements in function by doing some of the tests that I've mentioned before. There's much more I'll go to go into uh, live at the ECU, but uh, I hope that that's of some interest to you, and uh, I look forward to your feedback. Thanks for watching.